أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين فاطر السماوات والأرضين ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا أب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المظلومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله الآخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Brothers and sisters in Iman and Islam السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته once again, I extend my condolences to all the Muslimin and all the Mu'mineen, especially the Imam of our time, Ajr Allah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif, on the tragedy of Imam Hussein, of Sayyid Shuhada, and the rest of his companions on the 10th of Muharram. In the last few nights, we have been speaking about our relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and how our relationship is not simply one of a belief and an idea in our mind, and that's where. Allah sits. But that our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends to an agreement, a covenant embedded within the creation of mankind, in the fitrah of every single human being. And through that fitrah, we recognize our impoverished, impoverished nature and absolute need we have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by viewing and seeing our own weakness from even the material world. And that this fitrah also gives us a certain amount of guidance on what is good and what is evil. That intrinsically we understand there is things to do and things not to do. Certain types of actions are to be censured, certain types of actions are to be praised and followed. But when we see in our own experience in the world, we have many different actors, many different parties, many different camps and with many different ideas, ideologies and strategies that are trying to go to very often very different goals. And everybody claims and has an argument for their version of what is Hassan, what is good and what is evil. That there are very obvious examples that Nearly no human being would deny that this is evil and this is good. No one would condone the innocence of, or the 
evil nature of killing innocents, killing children, killing babies. Those things are something the fitrah of every human being will tell them that this is wrong. But beyond that level of clarity, many times we find ourselves in the chaos of the world and the obscurities in those gray areas we live in. And so there must be a way for us to know and to come to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us His fitrah, gave us this covenant in our very being. So what is that expectation from us? How are we supposed to come to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking from us. And so the ulama have, after their discussion on at-tawheed, on the unicity, the absolute oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they move towards the discussion of prophecy, of nubuwa. Now there are many different arguments the ulama bring forward for nubuwa. Oftentimes they deal with understanding certain first principles such, such as a contradiction cannot exist in the real world. Meaning that X thing, this book for example, cannot be in this place it is now and also not be in this place it is now at the exact same moment. That is impossible. Our minds show us that that is impossible. And we already have understandings such as that the whole is bigger than the part. These are things that the consciousness of the, in, of the human being immediately trust and understand as true. And using those principles, many ulama have found a way to prove and to establish the necessity of prophecy and prophethood. One of our major ulama of the past hundred years tried to do it in a a different direction. Instead of using deductive reasoning, many ways he used our experiential understanding of the world and certain things that must be. Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, rahimahullah, in his book, Al-Mursil al-Rasul wa risala the revealer, the messenger, and the message, he explains why is it that we need prophecy and prophethood. That when you look in the universe and in creation around us, we find that everything has its own internal divine mechanism that moves it from where it is now into fulfilling its potential. That there is something created within the seed that pushes it forward to move and become that grand oak tree that it becomes. That everything in creation has a ghaya. It has an end that it is to move towards and fulfill. That is one of the major phenomenon of this universe and our experience in creation. Everything has a ghaya. And this ghaya and this aim and goal that created things move towards is embedded within them. But the human being is unlike inanimate objects. A human being does not function completely that way. Because the human being has something of free choice. The human being has a will. And by having a will and being a free agent, that the human being decides, I'm going to do this and not that. That he is a deliberate creature. One who has purposes to his actions. He moves in a particular direction. His action is preceded by an understanding of what that goal is to attain. That the human being who is trying to find water in the ground and dig a well, he first has the idea of what he's looking for and then does he come to the action. He has a purpose that precedes what he does. And his purposes and his actions are not predetermined by a physical law much like other things in creation are. The human being's Actions are not predetermined like the drop of rain, which is you can predetermine where it will drop based on understanding physical laws of gravity, of motion, what the wind direction is, what the, how strong the wind is blowing, how strong the friction is. You can calculate all those things and predetermine laws in the universe of the physical world. You will be able to know what that 
where that drop of rain will fall. But the human being's actions are not like that. They move by the, they move to the tune of his own purposes that come to his mind. He comes to a purpose and he tries to figure that out in a, some sort of practical way. And the human being's purposes, he decides them based on whatever his requirements of life and living are. Whatever his needs are, he will put those in his mind and establish a course of action for that purpose. But it's not always that the human being decides what to do and takes a course of action because of the intrinsic value of the interest at hand. It may be in a, for example, better interest to clean up the masjid or clean up our shared spaces. But it's not in the individual interest of that person, so he will just say that will require me to expend energy, require me to do something that's not in my individual interest, so he will rather not do that, he will do something else that serves him as an individual. And so we can see that often the interest of the individual and the interest of the collective run into each other. That it is the interest of the individual to not share. It is the interest of the individual for his own personal benefit that he hoard, that he even perhaps lie, cheat. And those are short-term girls, short-term goals, for which clash with the long-term goals for which society, the in long-term interest that society needs to sustain itself. And so there must be something for the progression, for the sustaining of life, of society, to not fall into chaos and not for everything to end. That there must be something that will encourage and move the human being to act not in his self-interest, but in the interest that is beyond him. And that phenomenon and that law of creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established is that of prophecy and of prophethood. What prophecy does is that the prophet comes and he delivers a message that renders and overturns the long-term collective interest of human beings, of jama'at, from simply being the interest of a collective to making the whole interest, the interest of the collective, for the interest of the individual as well. That by coming and informing us of the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that there is a return, that this life is not the end of our existence. That God's justice is not such that those who do good and khair in this world and who die before they have seen the good that comes to them or the evil person who slyly lives his life and goes unpunished God's justice will come full circle. And if it does not happen in this life, it must continue somewhere else. That adal, al-ilahi, must be established. And so we know there is a ma'ad. And we know by the informing of the prophets and the messengers and the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our life continues and we will come to the divine court of justice for our hisab, our accounting on the day of judgment to see if our actions were hasan, were they good, or were they qabiyah. That we follow what we were commanded to follow, that we attain righteousness, did we follow that covenant we were given with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or did we neglect it? Did we abandon it? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And so this prophecy is based in the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in place to make sure life and society and creation functions among four human beings rightly. The, the truth of Yawm Al-Qiyamah and as well as the educational process of sending prophets and messengers and awliya to teach and preserve this deen. That we are told that this is the straight path to walk the straight path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim
And we may not know what, exa- what exactly is that sirat al-mustaqim. If we were to ask many people, even Muslimin, what is sirat al-mustaqim, we'll get a variety of answers. They'll talk about shahadatain, they'll talk about tawheed, they'll talk about justice. They'll try to define and understand what sirat al-mustaqim is many different ways. But the Qur'an itself, in the first chapter of the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Fatiha, that the Muslim reads, inshallah, at least 10 times a day. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. That Surah Al-Fatiha <coughs> tells us that Sirat Al-Mustaqim is not just a path of an ideas, but it is a path of people. Sirat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alihim. That the straight path is path of those whom I have blessed them. I have, they have incurred my blessing. <clears throat> because ideas and lofty principles left into the air, abstractly floating around without grounding, without coming into the physical world, are very weak. Because ideas, words, can be easily manipulated for one's selfish agendas and causes because one can take the ideas of justice the ideas of love and skew them to serve themselves but when you have lofty principles such as justice such as true love grounded in the example of a human being and a person that that person's example shows you what is justice what is true mahabba and love? What it, what it means to be humble, what it means to be God conscious, then it's very difficult for those selfish people with agendas to change what those principles mean because you have the red lines, you have the perfect example of those who came with that message in the first place. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And so there must be someone there to protect that message. Someone there who must be the arbitrator of what is haq and what is batil. What is the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth? And that is one of the differences that the ulama and the school of Ahlul Bayt have with other Muslimin. That when it comes to the wilaya and the truthness of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, There is absolutely no, agree- no disagreement that the Prophet Muhammad had a sallallahu alayhi wa had the maqam of wilaya in an absolute sense that with him was embedded the authority of religion, of dunya and deen and within him there was wilaya from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Prophet himself in his that did not have any authority but the authority comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so Everybody agrees that wilaya, truth and hujjiyah, knowing truth from falsehood, where can I turn to know what is haqq and what is batil? The arbitrator of that is the person of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. But after the Prophet, there became many camps. Two of those camps, one believed that without the Prophet there, the, his wilaya, his authority, his hujjia, and that infallibility, that isma that comes with it, becomes diffused through the ummah as a whole, such that the way we know truth from falsehood, the way we understand what is haq and what is batil, is when the Muslimin come together on a consensus. That when there is an ijma, that is the arbitrator of haq and batil, that is truth. That is the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after the Prophet. Then there are those who would later become known as the Shia, those who follow Ahlul Bayt. And their understanding was no, the wilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was embedded and given to the Prophet, that arbitration, that hujjah being the proof of Allah, this is haq and this is batil, did not move and diffuse, but rather it moved from one person to another person. And just like the Prophet was infallible, 
just like the Prophet was the arbitrator and the Imam and the Wali and the Hadi, whom he appointed afterwards as a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the arbitrator of haqq and batil, is the qasim al jannati wal nar. That the one who is appointed by Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the Hadi and the Wali and the Wasi, because he must be an arbitrator of truth. He must be the one who the, for whom there is no doubt in what he says, that he also must be infallible and ma'asum. And so these are two understandings of wilaya, two understandings of where the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And in our estimation, one is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the other one does not seem to be the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sunnah is that he sends divine guidance, sends his amr, sends warning, sends preservation of his deen through people. Through individuals throughout history, he sends prophets, messengers, imams, awsiya, for the message of Islam to be preserved. And those carriers of the deen, in their locations, in their localities, in their times, they are the hujjaj of Allah ala khalqihi. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا That this is the sunnah of Allah. One of the many sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you shall never, for the sunnah of Allah, find any changing. It stays constant. It is the same. And these examples, these awliya, the prophets, messengers, a'imma, the huda, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they embody guidance. That guidance must be embodied within people. And there are people like us. They are human beings. That the Quraysh actually would complain and say that how can guidance, revelation come to just an average person like us? And the Quran responds to them saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِلَّا إِنَّهُمْ لَيَأْكُلُونَ الطَّعَامَ وَيَمْشُونَ فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ That we did not send before you anyone from amongst the messengers except that they ate food and that they walked in the marketplace just like you would, just like an average, normal human being. That the prophets and messengers are human beings. They experience humanity just as if not more so than we do. And so they're able to understand what it means to be human. So they can properly give guidance to those like them. Because if the prophets and messengers were a different species, if they came as angels, for example, like some of the Quraysh and Mushrikeen wanted, then it would be easy to put them aside as, I am not like them. Give me a messenger like me. Such people are never satisfied, no matter if you give them what they claim they want or not. They are just there to deny and deny. And so the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the awliya of Allah are human beings like us so that we can relate to them. And they can relate to our problems, see our societies, know how to help fix them, take the abstract guiding principles from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the qawa'id al kawm wa tashri'ah, the principles of this universe and legislation that yesterday we spoke about one of the principles in reality is that the establishment of shukr, of gratitude, yield increase in blessings. That to take these principles and to show you how they are embodied. Yes, the prophets and messengers are human beings. The Quran says, quoting them, Bismillah ar-Rahim, innama ana basharum mithlukum. I am a human being just like you. And some Muslims take these Verses, take these parts of verses and say that, see that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is just a man, he's just a normal human being. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. That their understanding of the Prophet is that he is some average Abdullah or Zubair or whatever, and he is just a mailman. That he came, gave us the Quran, and that's it. No more, no less. He is a human being, and what separates him from us is the completion of the verse. 
yuha ilayya. I am a man like you. I eat, I drink, I have emotions, I have family, I have obligations to myself, to my family, to my society. But what distinguishes me is I have a special connection. I have been, I am selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am Mukhtar, I am Mustafa. And I receive the wahi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so our veneration for the prophets and the messengers and the awliya of Allah are not past the pale of what is appropriate. Many times those who venerate the prophets and the imams and the awliya of Allah, they are accused of committing polytheism or shirk. But that comes from a misunderstanding of what tawheed is. What is tawheed of ibadah? Because it's not just any khudu and any tadallun, any submission and humbling oneself that makes you a worshiper of them. But remember, it is doing submission, showing submission and humility to someone as if they are ilah or rabb. Because the prophets and messengers themselves showed khudu and tadallun for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as ilah and rabb, but they showed it also to those prophets and messengers who were above them. Nabi Lut alayhi salam was a prophet at the same era as Nabi Ibrahim. Nabi Ibrahim was his Imam. He was higher ranked than him. We have the, the Anbiya that were Ulul Azm. And there were many Prophets and Messengers. Not throughout history was it just like the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That there was just one Messenger and one Prophet at a time. But previously, at one given time to many different locations and people, many prophets and messengers were sent. And they had one amongst them who was above them, who was a rank above them, who was their imam. And so they would have to show yielding and submission to the command of their wali. And this wali was a human being. So they were not worshipping him because they knew that he is not Rabb and Ilah. He is just someone who has been sent by our Rabb and Ilah as a means of guidance to understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And so our dhikr for awliya is to orient ourselves and remember that these people are the prime, are the anwar of Allah, the nur Allah on this earth from which we are to seek guidance from. They are siraj al-munir. They are misbah al-huda. And they are an example for us to follow. We recited the beginning of this majlis. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That for sure, you have amongst you, in the Prophet, in the Messenger of Allah, a beautiful example. And being a beautiful example is not simply that he had nice manners, but his way of living, his existence amongst you was beautiful. That he showed you how to live and breathe what principles in life to apply. That he is meant to be followed just like a young mammal follows the footsteps of their mother. And this example that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi is. It's for one who has hope in Allah, knows that they will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will have hisab on the day of judgment. And they keep Allah on their mind. وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا They're not simply mentioning Allah, but they keep in mind their responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is that being their creator with, with whom they have a divine covenant? And these awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember that we spoke and we mentioned one hadith narrated from the Prophet in which he says, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ They take on the characteristics, the akhlaq, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not act in the world like a person. He is not a limited being from which we can see. And many times the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses loose language that are not exactly theologically, as a theologian and a philosopher, we might take objection to it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, 
ascribes to himself emotions in the Quran that comes to him ghadab, anger, and rida, and pleasure. And so this confused some of the companions of our Imams. And one of them came to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi afdal salatu wasalam. And he asked him about the ayah in which it says, فَلَمَّا آسَفُونَا إِنْتِقَمْنَا مِنْهُمْ And so when they brought anger to us, brought grief toward us, we took revenge from them. And so he's asking, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala become angry? And the Imam says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not become angry like our anger. His him becoming his asaf is not like our asaf. He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created awliya. And these awliya on his behalf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them for himself. And they show emotion. They show anger. They become stricken with grief and sorrow. And in other moments they are pleased. And they are satisfied. But they are makhluq. They are created beings. They are marboob. They have a rab. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala joined their rida, their pleasure, and their happiness with his happiness. That he made their anger and their displeasure his displeasure. Why? The Imam says, لِأَنَّهُ جَعَلَهُمْ لِأَنَّهُ جَعَلَهُمُ الدُّعَاةَ إِلَيْهِ That he made them callers towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالْأَدِلَّاءَ عَلَيْهِ And those who prove and show evidence and point you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, the Imam says that their anger and their akhlaq is my akhlaq. Just like you see in the verse of the Qur'an, وَمَنْ يُطْعِ الرَّسُولَ وَمَنْ يُطَعَ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَاءَ فَقَدْ أَطَاءَ اللَّهِ The one who obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who angers the messenger angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who fights a war with the messenger fights a war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Imam explains were he to take on characteristics like we do he would be a there would be tashbih, there would be a similarity between him and his creation. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states change, he's happy one moment, sad the other moment, angry at another moment, then there's, someone could say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not safe from disappearing and being destroyed or perishing one day. Al-ayyadu billah. Because these different halat, these different situations for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they change. That means he changes and things that change they're not safe from being destroyed because change means you are not permanent. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us these awliya because He made them and showed us that they are examples for us to live by, that they represent Him. They are the mazahir of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. And He made from amongst His awliya after the prophets and messengers, he made our awliya ahlil bayt. He put us under the wilaya of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad alayhim salam Remember that wilaya comes from the root waliya, which means succession, to be two things together, such that there is nothing between them but their own selves. That wilaya is a extreme form of qurba, of nearness, that you can't even identify that there is a gap between them. And when you have this type of wilaya, a qurba, that you have come to be in a new spiritual realm, a new spiritual environment in which you will be affected by the one who you have taken as your wali. And so when you have taken Muhammad wa Ali, Muhammad Ali, as your awliya, you become like them. You become like those you love. For example, two individuals come together 
in the sacred bond of marriage. At first, they are completely st complete strangers. They have their individualities. They have their different habits, ideas, and ways of thinking. But once they come together in this gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called marriage, and they establish that relationship of love and rahmah, mawaddatan wa rahmah, wa ja'ala baynakum, He made between them love and mercy. Once they love each other, then slowly you see that they start to take on the characteristics of one another. That they start to speak like each other. They start, they start to be able to finish the other one's sentences. They know the habit of their beloved and they can arrange for them anything they need on their behalf without having to ask. Such is the command of loving someone. And once you come and love Ahlul Bayt, you become the Ashiq of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, you become like Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma sayyidu ala Muhammad. Because the awliya of Allah, the anbiya al mursaleen part of their mission was not just to give us information and facts, but to purify us. That he sent from amongst them a messenger to these unlettered people. A messenger to recite for them his ayat, his signs, and to purify them, to do their tazkiyah. From amongst the companions of, of Ahl al Bayt, of Muhammad wa Ali, Muhammad alayhi salam, is a very special individual. Who knew Khatim al Mursaleen alihi, alihi wa ala alihi as salam, and he himself was called Khatim al Sahaba because he was the last person who was considered a Sahabi of the Prophet to die. His name was Abu Tufail, Amr bin Wathila. Abu Tufail died in about the year 102, 105, maybe 107 after Hijrah, long after the Prophet. And so he knew not only. The messenger, he knew Imam Ali, he knew Hassan, and he knew Hussein. He knew the Imams after Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And he was very young when he met the Prophet. And so when it came the time for the Khilafah of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, not everything about Amir al-Mu'mineen was known. Not everything, all the fada'il of Amir al-Mu'mineen were allowed to be in public. And so Abu Tufail was once in the company of Amir al-Mu'mineen al-Khutbah in Kufa. And Amir al-Mu'mineen stood upon the member and he said that I call witness to everybody here who was there on the day of Ghadir. And he saw the messenger of Allah pick up my hand and say, Man kuntu mawla fahada aliyun mawla. Allahumma wali man wala wa adi man wala. Whomsoever witness of Allah's messenger say that whomsoever I am is Mawla, this Ali is his Mawla. And 40 or more people stood up and they swore and they showed their testimony. Abu Tufail was not at Ghadir, but he was a prophet of the, a messenger, a companion of the holy messenger. And so he heard all this from Amir al-Mu'mineen himself, from these 40 companions affirming that this happened. But he said that for some reason in my heart, I couldn't accept it. Something in me. I knew that Amir al-Mu'mineen is truthful. I knew that all these companions could not lie. But I needed some other confirmation as well. And he said that later I had found the companion Zayd bin Arqam. And I asked him, I said, this is what happened in Kufa. And he said that by Allah, we were all there to see this with our own eyes and to hear with our own ears. So do not deny it. And so when the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger for the wilaya of Ahl al-Bayt is there, and such a person engages in that performance of tawalli, of wilaya, and he makes Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib a part of himself, comes to his qurba, that they are transformed. That if you read the rest of the biography of Abu Tufail, many of the scholars of hadith they mentioned that he was accused and considered an extremist Shia. Rumia bit tashayyu wal ghulu He's accused of being an extremist in his tashayyu. That 
Imam al-Bukhari was asked why did he abandon the hadith of Abu Tufair. He said that he had extreme Shiism. So I did not want to narrate this ahadith. This man was the standard bearer. Abu Tufail was the standard bearer of, the, of Mukhtar's army. That the movement of the Tawwabun after Karbala and the repentance for their negligence and their incapability on Ashura, the armies led by Mukhtar, Abu Tufail was the standard bearer of Mukhtar. And so you see the transformative quality of love, of Mawadda and of Wilaya. And that's why we're commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by his messenger to have mawadda for Ahlul Bayt. The Quran says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Qul la as'alukum alayhi ajran illa al-mawaddata fil qurba. I do not ask any reward for this, except mawadda for my qurba, for my near and dear and for my Ahlul Bayt. Qul ma sa'altukum min ajran fahuwa lakum in ajra illa ala Allah. That which I've asked you from Ajr, anything I've asked you from Ajr for this Risala is not for me, it's for you. My reward is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ مَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرٍ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ أَنْ يَتَّخِذَا إِلَى رَبِّهِ سَبِيلًا That that Ajr, that is for you, is for those who desire to take a path towards their Lord, a path of righteousness, of piety, of God consciousness, that is mawaddatan, al-mawaddata fil qurba. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And so no matter how young or old someone is, that they, they have the mawadda and the love for Ahl al-Bayt in them, then they will be transformed by that love. They say that one of the special companions who had that deep love and wilaya of Ahl al-Bayt was Habib ibn Mazahir. Habib was that special companion whom they even debate, was he a Sahabi or was he just a Tabi'in? Did he see and witness the Prophet in his Islam or did he become a Muslim later after the Prophet? And so it is narrated that when Habib was a child, the Messenger of Allah would come to him and show him his very special love and care. And they would ask that, Allah's Messenger, why do you show this young child such love and affection? And he says that this, this child here is already a companion of my Hussein. This man is a servant of my Hussein. For Habib was the kind of friend to Imam Hussein did not take him as his equal, but was a servant to Imam Hussein. That if Imam Hussein were to fall and become dirty, that he would be the one to wipe the dust off his clothes and tell him, Oh Hussein, you are the son of Allah's messenger and I am but a servant for you. And it was this kind of friend and this kind of servant for Imam Hussein that he longed for on the day of Ashura. That sometime before arriving, they saw that the enemy's camp would constantly get reinforcements from all different parts of the Islamic empire at that time, reinforcements would come, maybe a thousand, maybe 500 different battalions. And so Sayyid Zainab came to Imam Hussein and said, Oh my brother, will you not call for reinforcements? For I see the enemy is every day calling for reinforcement. Their numbers are growing and growing. And we are but a few men, women and children. And he said that, Oh Zainab, they may have numbers, but our men and our army, are much more in quality, that they are the companions who live and breathe for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he gathered some writing material and he wrote, Min Hussein ibn Ali ila rajul al Habib ibn Mubahir. From the son of Allah's messenger, from Hussein ibn Ali to that deeply learned man, Habib ibn Mubahir. And he wrote that, oh Habib, the time has come for you to fulfill your vows, to make your promises come true, to fulfill that covenant. To make that vow and fulfill that covenant in martyrdom. Oh, oh Habib, I am asking you to come to me and for a while I am surrounded from all sides. I am at siege by the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Habib, come to me 
in this stage, in this moment, in this situation, in order to sacrifice your life for Allah, to save Islam as a martyr in the way of Allah and His Messenger. And so they say that when this message had reached Habib ibn Mulahir, secretly for Kufa had already become sieged by Ibn Ziyad. That he took the letter of his mawla and he put it on his eyes and he kissed it as tabarruk and he said, this is a mess letter from my mawla. And he went to his wife and he and his wife read this letter together explaining that this is the situation and you must come now to Karbala. That, oh Habib, we are waiting for you, oh my beloved friend. And so Habib knew that he must go, but he did not want just this reward and the blood of martyrdom to be for him, but that his family to also share in this benefit. And so he asked his wife that this is a very important for me. You know that our Mawla and our Master have called us, so I am considering what I should do. And his wife looked at Habib and he said that, Oh Habib, you must go. How is it that you can even question that you must stay here? Oh, Habib, know that I will be able to take care of myself. I will run this house. I will take care of our children. For Habib, if you do not go, I myself will go to the camp of Imam Hussein. For I will not be able to stand on the day of judgment in front of Fatima al Zahra and say that I was not there to push and to fend the son of Zahra, to send the son of Allah's messenger. And so Habib ibn Mudahir took his beloved friend Muslim bin Awsaja and one of his servants and they left in secrecy in the dead of night and made it to Karbala, escaping not one siege that was around Kufa, but entering another siege around the camp of Imam Hussein. And Imam Hussein looked towards his companions, looked towards his family and he said that, Oh Abbas, oh my beloved ones, you would ask me why I left aside one standard after I had distributed to everybody the flag of Islam. And now this one left over, it has come. The man has come. My beloved Habib has come. Come welcome our guests. And when Habib came, Habib in the old age that he was in, that they say that he could not even stand up straight, that a man, two men in, his sev in their 70s, what sort of himma and strength of iman they had that drove them, that love, that passion for Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad to come and sacrifice their lives, even when a time of weakness, even when it was not at their ease. And they came to Imam Hussein, and I imagine as slaves come to their masters, and he said that, oh my master, oh Hussein, I am embarrassed to be in front of you today, for I am one of those who wrote you letters from Kufa. I was the one who would go to door to door asking them to come and support the cause of Ahlul Bayt. And I wished I would have been there to give and bring you thousands of men. And I come to you now as an old, weak, elderly man, but with another old, elderly man and one servant. Imam Hussein said that, you are enough, Habib. That your weight in Iman, Imam Hussein would have known that you could bring every man from Kufa, but they are not worth the dirt on the feet of Habib ibn Abu. And when the dawn of Ashura came, Imam Hussein gave Habib ibn Mudahir command of the left flank of his army. That Habib ibn Mudahir was a special companion. Some ulama say that he was amongst the companions of Sayyid Shuhada, their Sayyid Shuhada. That Habib ibn Mudahir was made the ca captain of a battalion for Imam Hussein. And they fought valiantly on the day of Ashura until the time of Zuhr came. When the call of Takbir Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and Imam Hussein requested from the army of Yazid that we stop for Dhuha, we stop for prayer. And one of the enemy soldiers said that, You want to pray? Your salah will never be accepted. Who are you to ask for prayer? And Habib became so angered and furious at hearing such insolence and disrespect to the son of Allah's messenger. And he went to Imam, he said to this man, how dare you say this to the son of Allah's messenger, to the one, the imam from Ahl al-Bayt in whose home salah descended, in whose home salah is an example for all believers. He came to Imam Hussein and sought permission to fight. And so Habib drew his sword and fought these men off. 
He killed many a soldier until they had surrounded him and they had wounded Habib such that he could not fight anymore. And I imagine he would have called out to his master one last time after the Imam had gone for his prayer and his companions had become, as they say, porcupines by the arrows of the enemy. Assalamu alaika, ya Mawla, ya Abu Abdullah. They did not let Habib die with honor. They had removed his head from his body. And they had taken that head back to Kufa. And they say that when the head of Habib on that spear was shown to the public, the son of Habib, Qasim came and he begged and pleaded from that soldier, give me the head of my father. I will give you anything. I will give you wealth. I will give you property. But he denied and he said, no, I am waiting for the reward of Ibn Ziyad. I am waiting for the reward of Yazid. And so they say that after they were leaving Kufa, this young son and his few youth came together to ambush this soldier and to take back the head. And when they had taken the head of his of Habib, the head of his father, he had said with such pride that, Oh my father, how can it be that a young son be alive and his old elderly father has been slain and his head put on a spear and he sit around and be powerless to do nothing. Imam Zain al abidi must have heard these words and looked to the head of his own father on a spear. <laughs> and said, Oh my father, the son of Habib speaks the truth. But oh my father, I am here in chains. My hands are bound, my feet are tied. Forgive me for my helplessness, I am not able to bury you. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Sayya'alamu alladheena zalamu ayyamun qalibin yan qalibun. Ma'atima Hussain.